Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cameron, and this is George. We're from Rackspace, the number one managed cloud company. Um, we're both what we call Rackers. That's a Rackspace employee. Uh, we're all about fanatical support. So we love doing awesome things for our customers, make their lives easier. We're from San Antonio. The big group inside our act space that we're a part of is, uh, is called Cloud Office. And that's a lot of, so it's email and collaboration software. We sell Exchange and then our own email product. George and I work for the infrastructure team within Cloud Office. So our version of fanatical support is building products that help our support team and operations team be awesome. <laughs> We're going to talk about our, uh, our a tool today that we've had in some iteration for about seven years. And it's for searching email, it's ser searching for email and authentication transactions. So our support team will use this tool to track things down for customers. Uh, so we'll go back to 2008. Uh, this actually got mentioned in the keynote this morning. Matt File was the guy who, one of the guys who helped build this back in the day. We were at about a million mailboxes in 2008. And as I mentioned, support, our support team needed to track messages for users so that they could confirm delivery, give a customer more information about what happened to a message or an authentication. And a little bit prior to that, we had started working on log aggregation because we had just been storing logs locally and then there was no, we had no way to search them other than going and doing greps on individual systems, which is not really the most efficient way to do things. And that meant that support couldn't do it, couldn't do that directly. So we decided that we were going to start aggregating logs and making them available for, subvert, for search. <coughs> And that enabled fanatical support for our support team. So the original system was a combination of ScribeD for getting a hold of the raw log messages initially and then transporting them to HDFS. We were running uh, Cloudera CDH2 for Hadoop. And that's where we ran, the, uh, we ran scheduled jobs to generate indexes. And then we had Solar 1.4 at a cluster of 10 servers that had uh, seven days worth of logs that were searchable. And then we had a bunch of custom tools to determine where the index needed to go and how the indexes would get to Solar. So quick overview. We were running ScribeD on each of the source machines. And then we had a tier of uh, ScribeD collector servers where we would ship everything. So that right there would exist in each of our environments. And then they would all eventually ship the logs to Hadoop. We had a set of tool servers that had MySQL and all the cron jobs to generate indexes and to do a few other things for, for the uh, web UI. And then we had an agent that was running on the solar nodes that would hit MySQL on the tool server, figure out what indexes it needed to grab out of HDFS, grab those, merge them, and then the things would be searchable. And then we had also a UI running on that, that node that, that our support team would use. So a little bit about the performance of that system. Um, transport was pretty fast with Scribe. Index generation was done via cron. It was 10 to 15 minutes. And then the indexes were available, but we had another job, like I said, running on the solar nodes that would either pick up immediately that, like if the 10 minutes were in sync, so we could have as quickly as 10 minutes things searchable, but most of the time it didn't line up that way. And later on we saw slowdowns in the MapReduce jobs, so it was more than 20 minutes most of the time before something was searchable. So support calls in, someone calls into support and they say, I just sent an email and I, it didn't go where I thought it did, where is it? It's a pretty terrible experience to say, call us back in 20 minutes and we'll tell you. It was great in the beginning, but later on, we scaled out. We had four, more than four million mailboxes. We hadn't really done any upgrades on that system other than scaling by adding nodes to clusters, which 
didn't really help with speed or reliability. Just gave us more storage. And we were dealing with a couple of code bases that were pretty much deprecated. We, like any kind of maintenance or, or improvement was pretty impossible for us. Nobody, nobody within our group knew the, knew the code base very well because the guys who had originally written all the stuff were gone. So we had two Hadoop clusters with over 100 nodes, 15, 15 to 20 VMs that were handling all this stuff. And we really wanted to use the raw log event data to do other things than just this search for support. And we couldn't do that with a system that we could barely touch without it breaking. So, uh, and like I said, we wanted, we wanted search to be faster. And we knew that there were tools available now, now that were so much better for that. So George is gonna talk about the next step and how we got better, so. So when we started this project, we uh, had several goals that we had kept in mind. The number one goal was improving customer support. At Rackspace, we're all about financial support. And for this particular project, the way in which we were going to improve customer support was providing search results faster. As Cam said, it was taking up to 20 minutes for support to find answers to customers' questions. We wanted to get that down at least under a minute. He also listed several technologies that we were using previously. Uh, we wanted to scale back as many technologies as we could. We just wanted to streamline the process and have um, you know, two or three technologies. He also mentioned the amount of custom code that we had just to maintain our solar indexes, build our solar indexes, merge them, clean them up. Um, we wanted to get rid of as much of that as possible. He listed, the, or at least talked about, uh, 100 physical servers that we had to support this system. We wanted to at least cut that in half, if not more. So the technologies that we chose were Flume to basically uh, handle uh, collecting the events from all the uh, servers producing these events. There were about 3,000 to 4,000 servers that were all generating between two and 20 documents that we wanted to uh, eventually index within uh, solar. So uh, we would use Flume to actually uh, ingest those. Um, we love solar, it worked great, but we were still running solar 1.4. We wanted to upgrade to the latest and greatest solar. We wanted to take advantage of near real-time indexing and the distributed search capability uh, found in solar cloud. Just by upgrading to solar cloud alone, that allow us to accomplish one of our bigger goals of actually reducing our custom code base. Just that uh, allowed us to save 75% or reduce a lot of the custom code that we had written previously by about 75%. The new architecture, <coughs> we still had you know, the 3,700 approximately servers that were producing these two to 20 events per second. Um, we pushed back some of the logic onto these servers that uh, would filter out the events and generate uh, just well-formed events into Flume that would eventually be indexed by Solar. This allowed us to get rid of our entire Hadoop complex. We had a tier one, one Flume that was distributed through all of our data centers that would handle taking these two and 20 events per um, server and batching those up into larger batches, compressing them, uh, encrypting them, and sending them down to a second tier Flume. The second tier Flume would have do a little more processing on the uh, events, um, uh, manipulate them to some extent, and fan out the events to whoever, whatever consumers that we wanted. We would stream them into solar for real-time indexing. We would also stream them to any other process that wanted to take action on these events in real time. We still had the web UI for our support team, along with a query API that users could hit directly to query the solar indexes. And we also spun up a second uh, smaller solar cluster that would maintain a larger um, uh, history of, of events. Our primary solar cluster that's being indexed in real time and searchable by our support staff is only about 14 days of, of information. The uh, smaller cluster actually holds about 60 days of information and we use it for um, analytics. It, it's smaller just because it doesn't have to handle as much throughput or much, as much indexing.
Hello. There we go. We're going to talk about the flume side and the solar side, some tuning things that were pretty awesome for us. <clears throat> so the first thing that, that I, I wanted to talk about when, when I thought about what was great for us with flume was uh, how we handled sync availability issues. So we have, as the previous diagram showed, we have two tiers of flume. If we, if we have any, like if, if, if the second tier goes down or becomes unavailable, you know, network problems, we wanted to be able to buffer events because we really didn't want to lose events ever. We wanted, we wanted to guarantee delivery as much as, pos as, much as possible. So uh, we looked at that problem. Uh, we tried, we'd, we'd solve the problem by using uh, some large file channel for Flume so the events would be durably buffered in channel. If, you, if the agent goes down, the, you can recover on restart with a file channel, which is great. And we had plenty of disk, even on the VMs we were running that first tier, so we were able to, to, to buffer, I, I think, 100 million events per node, which gave us, based on our, based on our, our rates during the day, that it gave us eight or more hours of back pressure handling just in case things were slower down. So we tuned our capacity by looking at our average event size, which is about 1K, and the amount of disk we had available. So that's how we came to the amount that we knew we could safely handle. Uh, we <coughs> tuned the transaction capacity to match up with uh, the second tier sync so that the channel could operate as fast as the, as the, as the uh, sync was trying to pull things off of it. And then minimum required space bumped up a little bit. The default's half a gig, but you want to make sure that your system has enough memory or enough disk available to keep doing the other things that it might be doing. And Flume will automatically stop accepting events if that threshold is reached. So we bumped that up a little bit to make sure that we, were, we stayed safe. This was, a, this was more fun. So George mentioned we have 2 to 20 events per server per second coming in. That's a relatively small batch size in Flume's, like in Flume's world. And we couldn't control that with our custom event generator, event generator very well. So we had to find a way around the initial solution. We had a file channel, which is pretty slow, relatively slow. And that was our, that was our bottleneck at tier one. We didn't want to scale out the clusters because we knew they weren't being pushed other than that one thing. So we came up with a, Another flow. This actually exists in Flume 1.6 as, a, as a, or a similar thing, which is the uh, <coughs> spillable memory channel. This is a different way of implementing that. Memory channels are awesome with the smaller batch size, and so we had no problems at that point accepting as many events as, as the systems wanted to send at us. And we just used a, what, what we took to calling loopback flows to, we would have an Avro sync that talked to a local Avro source back by a file channel, and then downstream to tier two through a second AvroSync. That was great because once we got past the memory channel, we controlled batching from there on out. So through the second part of this flow and then all through the second tier flume, we, we were much more in control of our throughput. So tier two is where we do more magic. Tier one is really just for aggregation and, and, and speed. So. Uh, we have several flows here. We have a couple of different event types that we deal with normally. The uh, auth events are pop IMAP auths, SMTP auths. Uh, mail events are actual, it's like, think of it like post, postfix and dovecot log lines that indicate something happened with a message. And we have a collection in solar for auth and for mail. So that's how we make those things searchable. As I mentioned earlier, we want to use events for other things too. So we had channel selectors that would split events into more than one channel. <coughs> and so we could get the same event to Solar and RabbitMQ. And then we also used the same loopback idea to do some additional uh, processing on events using interceptors. I'll talk a little bit more about interceptors in a second. But that allowed us to, to run an event through an additional type of filtering and then pass it downstream to another another service. So if we wanted to filter based on one thing first and then an another before we went to RabbitMQ, we could do that. So we got a subset of a subset of events. Uh, 
more finds were really awesome for us for working with solar. So we wanted to find, when we were building this whole system, we wanted to find a way to get events, get these streaming events into, into Solar Cloud as fast as we could, but also be able to manipulate them along the way if we needed to. So this is, this is not a, like a complete example, but it's just a, a quick example of a couple of things that, that we do in our morph lines. Uh, there are a lot of built-ins that helped us. Uh, for instance, the, the timestamp format that we were using for the originally generated event didn't match up with what Solar wanted, so we convert that for every event as it comes in. And we had a couple of different formats that we were handling, and the output, or output format was always exactly what we needed for Solar. Uh, we would populate certain fields based on context from other fields, so we would split up a user into a local part and a domain and populate those fields for search, because that was something that we needed to be able to search for. And then we had certain places where we wanted to do things that weren't implemented in the, in the regular, uh, like in, in the, in the built-in commands, so the, the JavaScripting support was, was pretty great. I don't have as much to say about that, because I didn't write that code. George and the other guys worked on that, but uh, it's it's been it's a it's been a fast way for us to do things like set set routing for RabbitMQ. Like uh, I can't remember, we just did this last week. Uh, the the routing stuff for RabbitMQ, but then there are a couple of other filtering based things that we couldn't do with the regular built-ins. Uh, we had we have. Uh, Solar locators, which is the way that you define a cluster, uh, set up for our different collections, and we have those pointed to an alias, so that we are always like we don't have to update the morph line when we when we write into cloud, but it allows us to add more collections later on, and, and it's just all it's it's in a flat file. It's really it, it was easy for us to get up and running pretty quickly, and then like I said, we we validate certain fields and then we sanitize the event because it it it's aware of the solar schema, so. We can clean everything up and then write to solar. And George is going to talk about the solar stuff now. From solar's perspective, it's pretty simple. We just needed to support 30,000 documents per second near real-time indexing. Um, we didn't have heavy query load. We only do about 10,000 queries per day. The one caveat to that is every single query is a heavy distributed query. All of them are doing facets, groups, sorts. Um, oftentimes, you know, the facets are across uh, fields with millions of unique values, so they end up being extremely heavy queries. And we also needed to remove supporting documents older than 14 days, um, and we wanted to minimize the impact that the Java uh, JVM garbage collection process would have on our indexing performance. So initially, we started off with four servers in server cloud mode added a collection, two shards, two replicas, and started testing some uh, indexing performance. With this configuration, we were able to index uh, roughly 2,500 documents per second. Based on our goal of about 30,000 documents per second that we wanted to support, um, it looked like we needed to increase this deployment by a factor of 12, which would mean that we would need a total of 48 servers. Uh, that, um, exceeded our goal. We needed to reduce our server count from over 100 to you know, about 50%, so 48 was doable, but no one was really happy with that. So um, without investing too much effort, we wanted to go out and talk to some people in the solar community. Most of us didn't have a lot of experience working with solar. This was the first opportunity that we had to work with Solar Cloud in a larger deployment. So we went out and talked to some of the people in the solar community that had actually worked on this uh, type of problem in the past. Rishi, he uh, actually gave uh, a speech earlier today about his deployment at AOL, and he was someone that we were spent a lot of time talking to. I spent days talking to him, hundreds of emails. He gave me a ton of advice on building out this, uh, this deployment. Worked out great. Uh, the manager that, that was running this uh, project, he had worked with Shawlin in the past, uh, I think Shalin had worked with uh, Rishi out at AOL, and uh, so they had a relationship. So we were able to get a lot of uh, good recommendations from Shalin about, hey, um, watch out for you know the uh, JVMs going out of memory, and uh, you have a zombie node out there, and you know things like you should use the embedded uh, Jetty for your uh, web server, and don't go with the uh, Tomcat. 
just to support upgrades in the future, things of that nature. And we su subscribe to the uh, solar user mailing list. We got a ton of advice through there, just reading all the conversations going back and forth in the community. There's always something popping up about, you know, tweak this config. Um, so that was a big benefit. After all of that, we were pretty confident that we could get it, the server count down at least to half, uh, half of the 48. So we were expecting about 24 servers. Um, we were pretty confident we could even probably get it under 20. And we knew that we can get the type of indexing performance that we were looking for. Uh, we wanted less than a minute. Um, so after this, we were pretty confident we can get it within seconds. The first thing that we tackled was our collection man management. We knew that we were going to, going to be ingesting about a billion documents per day and that we needed to uh, delete a billion documents today per day. So uh, we started off with rolling collections by date. Uh, each day, uh, an old collection is deleted, new collections added, and right there we can delete a billion documents, no impact to our in insert performance at all. It, it's seamless. We use aliases for um, any of the producers of events or the consumers so that they just hit one endpoint. They don't hit, and they're completely agnostic to the fact that we're rolling collections under the scenes. And for the type of indexing performance that we wanted, we were looking at sharding about 25 shards uh, with two replicas. Um, that if we were getting between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, uh, inserts per second per index per shard, um, that would get us to our roughly 30,000 or plus uh, uh, documents per second. So from a JVM perspective, we wanted to um, keep the JVM of about four gig. Uh, this allowed us to run five solar processes on each server and we just used CMS for our garbage collection. We liked the stats that it generated. We tested around with a few other garbage collectors and uh, all of them seemed to work well with our configuration, but uh, the stats for CMS I just preferred. We were only seeing garbage collections under very heavy query load. If we we're just doing uh, indexing, we wouldn't have any garbage collections at all. It's only when a, a heavy query comes in that uh, GC will kick in. Uh, when a GC does occur with this current configuration, it only takes about 10 milliseconds and averages less than 10 times per day per JVM. So this basically doesn't imp impact our index performance in any noticeable way whatsoever. Each JVM handles reads to 28 indexes with writes going to two indexes. The one thing that we did have to deal with was monitoring the JVM since we're running four gig uh, JVMs and we have you know, terabytes of data that could potentially be searched. Uh, we needed to be pr really proactive about uh, mo monitoring for out of memory situations. If we encounter situations where memory is not being released due to garbage collection, we end up getting trapped in these GC cycles, we restart the process. We're pretty aggressive about that. Um, you know, if we see a garbage collection taking, you know, seconds or really even uh, more than a, a couple of hundred, uh, hundred milliseconds, we end up uh, restarting the process because we know that, that there's a heavy uh, query going, in, going that's just going to run that JVM out of, out of memory. And once a JVM node goes out of memory, this has a cascading effect throughout the entire uh, solar cluster. Uh, one negative, one thing that users ten, tend to do is they submit a query, it's taking you know, 10 seconds, they resubmit a query, uh, and if our JVM is going out of memory, that second submit just hits another JVM and it goes out of memory and it can qu quickly escalate. For our uh, Real-time indexing, we leveraged the auto-commit functionality. We tested auto-commits between auto-commits and auto-soft commit settings. Uh, the auto-commit settings between five seconds and five minutes are with the auto-soft commit uh, between one second and one minute. We were trying to tune these to balance out uh, memory usage versus disk I.O. We wanted uh, to maintain um, a high performance but also not impact any reads that were going on. Um, and not run the JVM out of memory or put any un unnecessary memory pressure on the JVM. So the sweet spot for us was about five seconds for auto commit with one minute, uh, well, five seconds for auto soft commit and one minute for auto commits. This worked really well. Talking about uh, out of memory, um, originally 
we struggled with a lot of out of memory errors. Like I was saying, pretty much all the queries coming into our uh, cluster were distributed, faceted, grouping, uh, sorting queries. So we developed a whole process that would monitor, monitor this and uh, try to catch those nodes early on and automatically restart them before it impacted the uh, indexing performance for the entire cluster. Um, as I said, these were all due to distributed faceted group sort queries and the solution for us, I actually sent Rishi an email on this specific situation saying, hey, this is what I'm seeing. He just responded, responded back saying, hey, try dog values. Turned it on and problem went away. We didn't have a problem at all. You know, you could go through and run a facet query on our uh, distributed indexes that was faceting a field with millions of unique values and no out of memory errors, even though all of our JVMs are only four gig. From a caching perspective, there's various caches that you can, uh, various cache, caches that you can tune within Solar. We tried tweaking pretty much all of these. Um, our queries were extremely diverse. Um, every single query that comes in is completely unique and unpredictable as far as what that data is going to be. So there's no consistent queries that we, we could really tune for. So our cache hits were pretty low. Um, so most of the caching was not a benefit to uh, any of our workload. Just didn't justify the memory overhead of maintaining these caches that were continually, uh, continually being flushed out. Uh, and also we were willing to accept solar, sl slower queries. Uh, we're only getting about 10,000 queries per day. Um, so if the query goes from taking 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, it really doesn't matter to us. I mean, from a user's perspective, 100 milliseconds isn't much different from 10 milliseconds. Um, and since we were only doing 10,000 queries, it, it didn't really amount to much. If we were doing millions of queries, maybe that jump would actually matter. But for us, it was still sub-second uh, query response time. So it worked great with us just uh, being real stingy about our caches and reducing them down as much as possible. From a config standpoint, we started off with the, um, just the example config um, that's showing off all of the cool features of Solar. Um, it worked great for us. Uh, the only problem is, is they use up resources, or uses up memory. Some of the uh, features uh, cause Solar to take a little longer time loading indexes. So uh, quickly we realized that we should just turn off any features that we're not uh, leveraging. So we went through, stripped out pretty much all the advanced features of Solar and we were basically just using the basic uh, real-time uh, indexing and searching functionality. So. If you take any advice from that, just start with a trim down config. There's no, no reason having a bunch of features turned on that you're not leveraging within your deployment and add the features as you need them. And Cam, he's going to talk about some performance information. Just a little more about the performance. I know we talked about the new stuff a bit. <coughs> but this is the, our, the final product ended up uh, being able to do 50,000 docs a second sustained. Um, and as George said, that's about, we handle about 1,000 docs per sec for uh, each replica because of the auto soft commit stuff. About five seconds time to search for things, um, the 10,000 queries. Uh, a billion documents a day, we keep 13, 14 billion, and then we have about 70 of indexes. Now from the things that we used to have, we went from 20 plus minutes to less than five seconds. So support could now be on the phone with a customer and say, send an email. And then, then support could search for it and they could confirm to the customer whether or not that email came through. So to us, that was enabling fanatical support. We had accomplished that goal. It was awesome. The, the big gains for us on the engineering front and just on the maintenance, taking care of the system, we weren't doing batch processing anymore, so we cut out all of Hadoop and we just indexed on delivery. So or in, we, we were indexing in solar. We didn't need that middle processing layer. And then, of course, near, near real time was just so much cooler than what we were doing before. Uh, on the environment front, we stayed about the same at the transport layer. No storage layer, really, because we were, we were handling all of the things with solar. And then 
we were doing the same, we were doing double, double the, well, more than double the data that the old solar servers were handling. So they had three or four terabytes of indexes. Same cluster size, but way more data, which is awesome. And that was, yeah, 80%, which was great. Less things to deal with. So coming up, we've, we've got plans right now to actually go with SSDs. We've just got SATA drives, uh, just, just RAID 10 SATA. But we have some, uh, we have some servers with SSDs that we're gonna start rolling into the cluster, because that, uh, after talking to Rishi, he said he saw some pretty awesome improvements from that, so that's, that's in the pipeline. <coughs> uh, when we do that, we're gonna have a separate, like we're gonna have the, a separate index set of servers that are handling the inserts, and then we're gonna roll collections, since we do the daily, we, we keep 14 days of data and we roll collections on, on the daily, we're gonna have a separate set of servers that are ha handling inserts so we can tune differently for, perform for query performance on the servers that don't, aren't receiving any inserts. <coughs> and that's uh, the JVM tuning is gonna be for those other servers because we've already got a pretty good tune for the insert side of things. And then we haven't figured out exactly how we're gonna do this yet, but we definitely wanna go multi-DC. It sounds like there's some stuff in, uh, there's stuff in the works right now that would be good for like a backup cluster or, or uh, like more of a, Async replication, which m that probably meets what we're what we're looking for. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what we got. Thank you. If you guys have questions, Oh, the D1 garbage collector? Uh, we didn't test that one specifically. We actually heard um, that it actually works pretty well. Um, I think, I uh, forgot who it was, but someone had, do, had done some testing specifically with solar and that collector, and they were saying that that was actually very good on the, um, I think it was a 5.1 release or the 4.10 release, one of those, but we specifically didn't um, test that garbage collector. The restarting of the replicas. We, like I was saying, we're pretty aggressive about trying to identify um, JVMs that are going out of memory. We don't wait until the JVM actually goes out of, out of memory. We basically track the scenario where, okay, um, the JVM hits an out of memory situation, it collects the garbage, and it basically just drops by 5% and then it immediately goes into a new garbage collection and drops by 5%, immediately goes into a new garbage collection, and it just keeps this cycle up for several seconds. And when we notice that, we basically uh, just do a service restart on the process and do a clean shutdown before it goes out of memory, because if it goes out of memory, you potentially have to do a kill nine or something like that, but <laughs> we basically try to uh, capture it beforehand while it's still being responsive, do a clean shutdown, so it basically can uh, we'll go ahead and shift the leader to the other replica and then uh, restarts and everything's working. Yeah, we... we yes, yes, it's, so we use CollectD, uh, we use the uh, JMX plugin for CollectD and we ship those metrics to a graphite cluster and we, we query graphite through our monitoring stack to figure out uh, those stats. Uh, it's the, uh, since we use the concurrent mark sweep uh, garbage collector, we actually have the time spent in GC along with the, uh, the actual amount of memory that's being used. So if we look at the amount of memory and it's continually staying at, um, you know, over 70% uh, and also we're looking at the time spent in GC and if it's continually being, you know, 100 milliseconds every second for you know, so, so many seconds, then we're like, okay, you know, it's spending a lot of time uh, trying to do garbage collections, and it's basically stuck in this cycle where it just continually tries to do a garbage collection. And based on those stats, we go ahead and we'll restart the, uh, and, and we have a, uh, an adjustable time frame where it might be over a minute or might be over two minutes, but when we find that pattern, we'll go ahead and restart that, uh, that process.
The reason for that is because if we had one JVM, and let's say we chose a 32 gig JVM on these servers, uh, at the point at which a garbage collection occurred, it would um, have a larger impact. It might take a second, two seconds to do the garbage collection. And for that second or two seconds, that could actually mean thousands of inserts aren't happening. So it basically can cause back pressure into flume. So we want to keep our JVMs as small as possible so that our garbage collections would be super fast and it wouldn't impact our indexing performance. So it was all about uh, not in, in, impacting our indexing performance due to a big garbage collection. Hmm. Cool. Huh. That's, that's good to know. We'll, we'll definitely yeah. write that down. Uh, deleting the billion documents, that's when we're using the uh, rolling collections. So basically, deleting a billion documents is a matter of just deleting a collection, which is, you know, just removing the information from, you know, Zookeeper and removing the files from the file system. So it's basically super fast. It has no impact on our indexing performance or anything else. It's just, you know, get rid of that whole collection and we yeah, just the collection rolls a new off collection after we yeah, to uh, handle the new one. inserts coming in. Well, we um, we use aliases. Yeah, I mean, assume, I guess the delete probably takes less than a couple of seconds uh, to actually do the delete of the actual collection. But before we do that, we update our aliases. So our aliases no longer include that collection. So there's no uh, reads coming into that collection. If there were reads coming into that collection, maybe there would be some type of contention on it. But because we've already updated the alias, there's nothing actually routing any events to or any requests to that collection. So it's just a matter of, you know, removing the files and removing the, uh, the metadata from uh, Zookeeper. So it's, it's super fast compared to trying to actually delete documents within the indexes, indexes and then trying to optimize the indexes to re actually remove the documents. So. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's that's actually yeah. They, I think 1.6 has all the Kafka stuff. Uh, we we talked about that early on, but it wasn't as a, it wasn't as official. Uh, like it wasn't actually part of the like the main release for Flume. Um, and we're definitely still interested in that at some point because that gives us a little more flexibility with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 that's something I, I definitely want to explore in the future. And we, and we, I'm oh, sorry. What was that? If a flume agent goes down, um, so. Let's see. Uh, we so we we have those sitting behind a load balancer at each at each tier. So tier one has a load balance cluster. We've got four four nodes in each of the tier one clusters. So if we lose one, typically the other three can keep up just fine with the, whatever traffic's coming through. And then depending on the nature of that node going down, uh, we would potentially lose anything that's in the memory channel. But it's so fast to get to the file channel that that's that's a pretty minimal loss. That's we got to stop after this, but. Yeah, it, uh, we would just re recover the node however we need to or provision new nodes and just bring them into the load balancer. It's the same at tier two. Yeah, if you guys have yeah. any other questions. Yeah, any other questions, we're, we're happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.